Well, good evening, everyone. You know, I'm always impressed with our song leaders here. Tommy wanting to move a, a song up or down a little bit, and meanwhile, my margin of error is about two notes. So, Okay. So, um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to be here last week. Um, so Matt Ebbotson got the really cool chapter on the shipwreck and all that. Um, we're now in Acts chapter 28, and um, this is the last chapter of Acts, right? So we've been studying Acts for a, about six months now, more or less, and I'm going to go ahead and prep you towards the end of this. It's really open discussion. So I told you when I, I first got up here about six months ago, hey, the more you talk and the less I talk, the better off we'll all be. So be thinking... Uh, along the way of what have you gotten out of Acts? What would you consider the main points of Acts to be, right? So if, if you were talking to somebody who had, you know, less Bible knowledge maybe, was still learning, how would you summarize Acts, right? Um, and what are the, the key things, though, that you would um, get out of this book, okay? All right, so we're going to be starting off again in Acts chapter 28. Where are we? Uh, Malta, although technically we don't find that out until verse 1. Um, what just happened? So Paul was shipwrecked, right? So backing up a couple of chapters, uh, Paul had gone back to Jerusalem. He was arrested there. Uh, he now has been uh, eventually appealed to Caesar and then was sent uh, to Rome. On the way, he was shipwrecked, and that's where we are. When are we? Um, around 60 AD. Uh, again, anytime you see me put a date up here, it, it is approximate. Okay. So... Acts chapter 28 and verse 1, I do recommend you open up your Bibles because, uh, again, the print's pretty small. When they had been brought safely through, then we found out that the island was called Malta. The natives show us extraordinary kindness, for because of the rain that uh, had set in and because of the cold, they kindled a fire and received us all. Okay, so where are we? Let's look at the big picture first. So, you know, here's Europe is up here, right? Uh, he was coming from Jerusalem, down here in the uh, southeast corner here. Remember, on his uh, journeys, Paul's missionary journeys, where had he gone to? More or less, he goes up through Tur what's now Turkey and up around Greece, spends a lot of time in Greece, spends a lot of time around uh, Ephesus, things like that, and, of course, on the islands as well. But now he's being sent from Jerusalem to Rome, okay? And he is shipwrecked on his way up there. So... I'll remember this. So first of all, Italy is like the easiest country to uh, find in geography, right? Nobody missed this question in geography class. Uh, Italy is the boot, right? Sicily is the thing that the boot is kicking, okay? So that's the way you can remember that. So now we have Sicily. Now you all saw how small Sicily was, right? There's Malta. It's a little dot. So it's a dot. It's a little pebble of, that fell off of Sicily. It's about 60 miles south of Sicily, something like that. Uh, interesting little island. Uh, again, it is very little. Um, there's kind of three main islands. I'm sure there's some little ones that you can't even see here, but three main islands right there. Um, you see there it's called St. Paul's Bay. That's not how Paul knew where to land. Okay, good. You got it. Thank you. Um, was it known for? Now, this is much more modern than what was there at Paul's time, okay? Um, however, if you saw, backing up a couple of slides, where this was, notice it's in the main pathway, right? So naval warfare wasn't anywhere near as big as it was going to be, but if you controlled Malta, then you more or less controlled access to the Mediterranean, right? So they built forts there. The earliest I had um, forts being built there was something like 1450 BC. Obviously, this is more modern than that. Um, so it was somewhat of a uh, fortification place, but it was not very well populated. There weren't a whole lot of people on there. Um, you, you notice the, the language, at least in my version, said the natives, right? I mean, it, it was, it was um, out there, right? Uh, what else were they known for? Uh, since it's obviously a, a military facility, then you must have a lot of vicious things, vicious creatures on there. Um, so the Maltese dog, 
It actually came from uh, from the Phoenicians. They they introduced the predecessor to um, the Maltese, but again, that's what it's known for nowadays. All right. So then we get into. <laughs> I actually looked that up. Okay. So the Maltese Falcon. I looked it up. It's a great movie. It's not real. The, the, the actual Maltese Falcon isn't real as far as I could tell. So unfortunately, no. But but yes, that was actually the first thing I looked up to see if that was real. Okay. Um, so Acts 28, verse 3, now we get into some of the fun stuff. So we got fire and we got uh, vipers, you know. So in verse 3, But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the natives saw this, uh, the creature hanging from his hand, they began uh, saying to one another, Undoubtedly, this man is a murderer, and though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Okay, so this is an interesting verse. It's an interesting passage. Um, I've got a uh, commentary on Acts that I, I think was written in the 60, 1960s, something like that. Um, even then, they pointed out something that I also saw in line, and it's a little bit of a, an issue that people have with this, uh, these two verses, and that is there are no venomous snakes on Malta today. Hmm, okay. So, Obviously, uh, people have been theorizing about, well, what exactly happened then? So there's four theories that I found. I'm sure you could find more if you tried. Uh, but there's four theories, and man, that's small text. Sorry about that. But four theories that I found. One is there were venomous snakes, but they died out. Okay. So again, the population, it was extremely small there. These are extremely small islands. It wouldn't be very hard to purposefully drive something to extinction, extinction there. Um, or it could be that, hey, it just happened, right, as people grew, that it, uh, nature kind of got pushed out of the way. Okay, so that's one theory. Uh, the next theory is the snake was brought in with the ship, sort of. Maybe you can uh, put some different methods here. Uh, wood brought aboard the ship. Um, remember, the ship crashed in to the island, right? So it, it actually was still there. Yes, it, it said the stern was breaking it up, up and all that, but it's not like they had to um, abandon the ship way out. So yes, technically wood could have been brought aboard that ship. It could have been brought aboard any other ship though, right? Um, one of the things to point out that's a little bit in favor of this theory is it was winter. So snakes would have been uh, going dormant, they're cold-blooded, and so they would not have been as likely uh, to uh, pop their heads up if that was the case, okay? Um, the third, and, and uh, this one, a little weird, but uh, Paul made all the snakes on the island non-venomous. Okay, technically, could he have done that? I'd say yes. I mean, he had God's power. If, God, if that's what the Holy Spirit commanded him to do, yes, he could do it. But we have no indication from the Bible that that's what he did. Um, there was not really a reason for him to do that. Um, so, okay, I'm just going to leave that there. I don't believe that's really it. The fourth one is interesting, um, and I think we ought to cover it here, uh, and that is Malta is not modern Malta. Okay, so going to... Uh, Acts chapter 27, uh, and verse 27 as well. And, and by the way, uh, if people have different versions, do speak up, because this is uh, part of the conversation here. In verse 27 of Acts chapter 27, it says, But when the fourteenth night came, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors began uh, to surmise that they were approaching some land. Okay, does anybody have anything other than Adriatic Sea? No? Okay. If you read some older versions, I cannot remember who was King James. Uh, it might have been, maybe some others. It said something like the Sea of Adria or, or something like that. It was a slightly different uh, uh, type, I guess you could say. So they were in the Adriatic Sea. Okay, this is, it, it, uh, let me keep going and then I'll show you where, why that's a little bit of a problem to take anything from that. Now turn to verse 28 and verse 1. Remember I said that they landed on Malta. In the American Standard Version, it says, and when they, uh, excuse me, and when we were escaped, then we knew that the island was called Melita. That's different, isn't it? Well, which one is it? Okay, so Melita, 
is an old name for Malta. So we're good there. However, Melita happens to also be the name, uh, an older name, for this uh, little island, which uh, I'm not really sure how to pronounce that. It's one of those J things, that like Milliet or something like that. Anyway, that happens to be there. Okay, well, why is that important? That's the Adriatic Sea. Okay, we're done, right? They were in the Adriatic Sea, they landed at Melita. Well, unfortunately, it's not that uh, easy. The Adriatic Sea, from what I could tell, it wasn't like nowadays where they had all the books and everyone agreed this is what this sea is and all that. So the Adriatic Sea, it seemed like was like here. And all of a sudden it's like, well, mm, it, we'll, we'll get into another reason why that might be an issue. However, something in favor of that, that little island was that until recently, and literally this is 1910, this island was infested with vipers. Um, so they actually, in 1910, brought in uh, multiple mongoose, mongoose, I don't know, uh, whatever it is. Um, and the, the symptoms of this viper uh, literally were swelling due to uh, hemorrhagic edema, ed edema, excuse me. Uh, falling down to faintness and dizziness, uh, respiratory shock, uh, pulmonary edema, and things like that. And that's what he looks like. Probably not something we want to uh, encounter. Uh, also known as the horned uh, viper, long nose viper, uh, and the nose horned viper. Okay, but here's the, the problem with that theory that it was the Melita that's up there. Um, and that is the path that we're about to read a few verses from now in verse 12 through 13. Yes, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, when you read the 28, that Paul was bitten by a viper. Yes. You can go back to Mark 16, and it ties to that. It says, you take them to jail and service for being a deadly thing, or you can do more harm than So that was tying, letting you know who that was talking about there. Mm -hmm. The apostle was not just everyday people. That's a good point. Yeah, and, and sorry, if you couldn't hear uh, William, um, what he was saying, that, that was in Mark, correct? Mark 16, talking about um, handling of snakes, basically. It was talking about, it was tied to this, right? So it, it's not saying that, hey, if you're a Christian, you can handle snakes. Do not try that at home. It does not work. Um, that was one of the miracles that they were able to perform. Uh, so no, that, that's a very good point. Okay, so here is the other geography issue with that theory uh, that Melita is not Malta here. And that is in verse 12 through uh, 13, it talks about the order that they go. So again, Mal uh, Malta uh, is down here. It says they went to Syracuse and then, uh, Luke wasn't Reggio, but uh, exactly, but something like that. And then on up there. So if they were here, first of all, why did they not just get a ship directly across? Um, because here's their destination. Why would they bother going all the way there? It's not that far across Italy, right? So that would have been a lot easier. But even if they did, then, wow, that's kind of a, a long route. So I looked up multiple commentaries. All of the commentaries that I saw agreed that Malta, the island just south of uh, Sicily, is Melita. That's the one in the Bible. Okay, any comments, questions, other theories? No? Okay. Um, and, oh, and I should have pointed out, um, back on here, the snake that uh, was brought in, the snake was brought into the ship being a theory. Notice what the natives said. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to another, undoubtedly, he's, you know, he's going to die. So, it kind of raises the question, did they recognize this snake? Or did they recognize it was a viper? Or just, well, it's a snake, right? Um, if you ask my wife, all snakes are venomous, so, you know. All right. So then we go to... Sorry, I just got off a little bit. There we go. Uh, let's go to verse 5. It says... When he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm, oh, excuse me, however, he uh, shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. But they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. 
But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their mind and began to say that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place uh, were lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days. And it happened uh, that the father of uh, Publius was lying in bed, afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery, and Paul went in to see him, and after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. Okay, so moving on from the snake. Um, Paul, what, what did God promise to Paul? That he was going to Rome, right? He was going to make it to Rome. So I, I told you we were going to move on from the snake, but I got one more point. I always do, right? So when Paul was bitten by the snake, did he freak out? I would have. I, I, I would be rather upset, right? This would be a, a, not a good thing. Uh, but we see here he shook off the snake, and now he's good. So God had already promised Paul that he was going to Rome. Now, back to your point, back in Mark, we, we found out that this was one of the things that they could do, so he probably remembered that. I'm not even sure if I had been told that. That would have been enough for me, but still. So to him, this was almost a non-event because his faith was secure, right? He knew that he was going to Rome. Notice what he does, though. In, on his journey to Rome, he's shipwrecked, and what does he start doing? He's already healing people, right? Do you think he was just healing them and keeping quiet about why? No. He's like, oh, hey, this is an island. I assume he probably knew about the island that he had never been to before, never been to on one of his uh, missionary journeys, but he stopped and he taught. And you can imagine what happened after that in verse 9. After this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. They also honored us with many marks of respect, and when we were setting sail, they supplied us with all that we needed. So, first of all, these, these seem like really nice people, by the way. I guess they probably were uh, accustomed to people stopping in uh, because of where it is in the middle of the Mediterranean, which is another point for that being Malta. Um, but really, they were very welcoming, and they were able to help each other. Paul was able to preach to them. They were able to help them. And we're about to see there were other people there wintering as well. All right, any questions on this section or comments? Yes, Mark. It's uh, mongooses, by the way. Mongooses. Yeah. Really? It's not yeah. mongoose. That's weird. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Mongooses is the plural of mongoose. Okay. Your comment as well. Sure. Uh, so, you know, this doesn't even, you know, the, the litany of things that Paul experienced, shipwrecks, beatings, stoning, mm -hmm. this didn't even great on that one. <laughs> That's uh, true, so, yeah. You know, it wasn't a big deal for him. Right. Yeah, to Mark's point, um, by this point, he had been beaten so many times and, and shipwrecked and everything. What's one more snake? You know, no, no big deal. Good point. Any other comments or questions? I do very much welcome comments. What I picked up on, too, to go back to verse 8, mm -hmm. is that Paul visited him and prayed and put his hands on him. Yes. If Paul had the power to heal him, why would he pray? Yes, and, and not... Well... He prayed because that was the right thing to do, but also that was an example to them, right? Um, that was showing them. Remember, they had just called him, well, I'm not sure if they called him to his face, but they said, hey, he, he must be a god, right, because he didn't die. Who's he praying to then if he's a god, right? This is demonstrating to them, hey, this isn't my power. This is God's power. Yes? I may be being really simplistic here, but... The list of reasons how that snake got in there. Yeah. I just look at it and think, God could have put that snake. God in wanted the snake there. Yes. Right. Just like He provided a sacrifice. Yep. In the place of Isaac, He could have put that snake there because it set Paul up to show God's power on that yeah. island. That's true. The snake needed to be there. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Okay. Um. Yeah. Kind of study with people on that too. It shows you. How fickle people are. And so, first, when he got busy, they said, Oh, he's a murderer. God's destined to die. And then he shook it off and said, Oh, okay, he's not a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. It seems like Job, doesn't it, at first? It's like, Oh, well, you know, God must be cursing you. You need to curse God back. Uh, Paul doesn't, obviously. Um, and neither did Job. But yeah, you're right. People can be fickle. And um, wow, that's a whole other lesson, isn't it? 
Hmm, that's a good point. Okay, that, that'll be need, need to be a, um, I just found out I have a, uh, um, a Devo that I need to give, so I think that might be it. Okay, <laughs> so let's not talk anymore about it. <laughs> All right, uh, verse 11. Paul arrives at Rome. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So the chief man in the island, Publius, yes. um, uh, there's uh, inscriptions that have found, archaeological inscriptions. Mm -hmm. For a long, long time, people thought that, that name was strange. Huh. And another reason why people kind of doubted the whole account was for that strange name, but they found since found inscriptions of Publius, yeah. the chief man on the island. Huh. Well, that's interesting. And where did they find it? On Malta, thank you. All right, yeah, I'm, I'm really going for Malta myself. All right, so sorry, if you didn't hear Matt, what he was saying was that um, for a long time, Publius apparently is a strange name for the location. Um, and so that was another reason people were uh, trying to question the, uh, the account. Uh, but apparently they found inscriptions on Malta of that name, chief, chief of the island, Publius. That's a very good point. Okay. Um, verse 11. At the end of three months, we set sail on an Alexandrian ship uh, which had wintered at the island. So th this ship was there over the winter, same time period as they were, uh, and which had the twin brothers as its figurehead. After we uh, put in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. From there, we sailed around and arrived at uh, uh, Regium. And a day later, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, uh, we came to Catoli. Okay, so first of all, who are the, the twin brothers? I, I thought I knew this. I was like, oh, ooh, ooh, Romulus and Remus, right? I knew this. No, that's not it. All right, so apparently the twin brothers in this case are Castor and Pollux. Um, it's another one of these things where it crosses over between Roman and Greek and all that. But anyway, they were, I, what, the way I read it, it said patron saints. I don't know if that's what they would call them, of sailors. Uh, and the sailors believe that they were the source of St. Elmo's fire. Um, so St. Elmo's fire, if you're not familiar with it, is like uh, electrostatic discharge. Uh, so for the sailors, it would be like this, where it's at the top of a masthead. And it, it requires very specific conditions, but you get this um, uh, positive and negative uh, discrepancy, and all of a sudden it starts discharging, and that's what you see. Um, Every now and then, this will actually help happen on aircraft, and they've got these little metal rods um, to direct that, which is kind of cool. All right, any questions about that? And this is, the, by the way, the what I was talking about where they showed the route. Okay. All right, so then we go to verse 14. There we found some brethren, and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and thus we came to Rome. And the brethren when they heard about us, uh, came from there as far as the market of Appius and three inns uh, to meet us. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. When he, we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. Okay, so first of all, he made it to Rome. Yay, right? This has been a long time in coming, many years in coming. Um, they, they brought him in. He was very happy, obviously. Uh, where did they put him? Did they throw him into the slammer and shut the doors and all this? No. He's under house arrest. What does that tell us? Yeah, they, they kind of trusted him. Do they, does this sound like some, I don't know, terrible person that they're very concerned about? No, he was under house arrest. They, they already knew that he was not a threat uh, to Rome. Um, it, it's a little interesting that they, uh, the soldier who was guarding him, basically they just paired up, so that was his roommate. Um, seems a little inefficient, but still, okay, fair enough. Probably, okay, I, I, as I said that, I realized my mistake. Uh, most likely, who is paying for the uh, guard? Paul, right? Through donations, you know, things like that. But yes, most likely that in that day and age, that's what you did. Um, so what does that set up, though, by him being in his own place? And, and I say his own place. I mean, he was probably renting it or something like that. But anyway, he had his own house. He was under house arrest. What did that set up? Anyone? Why is he in Rome? To evangelize. Yes, to evangelize. It's harder to evangelize 
if you're in solitary confinement, isn't it? But if you're under house arrest, you can have house parties, I guess. You know, people can come over to you, and they do. All right, so verse 17. After three days, Paul, to, Paul called together those who were the leading, man, uh, leading men excuse me, of the Jews. And when they came together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I have, had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me uh, because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. Okay, so this is a really important part. I think we all remember that uh, Paul appealed to Caesar, but we need to remember why. It wasn't that the Romans were going to execute him, and so he appealed to a higher level of Roman authority. It was the Romans were kind of going to just give him over to the Jews, like, okay, well, you're free to go, and the Jews were going to kill him in Jerusalem, and so he appealed basically for his own safety. So just keep that in mind. It, it's not that the, um, that the Romans were going to execute him. Okay, in verse 20, uh, For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. They said to him, We have never... We uh, have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we desire to hear from you uh, what your views are for concerning this sect. We've talked about that a lot. It is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. When they had uh, set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and he was explained to them uh, by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Okay, so he's doing what he has done over and over again, right? Every time he goes into a town, he calls together the Jews. Usually it's a synagogue. It's not now. He's under house arrest. Um, but in this case, he calls them to him. Um, a couple of little tiny points here. In uh, verse 21, it says, uh, we have never, uh, we have neither received letters from Judea uh, concerning you. What it what they're talking about isn't like um, just some random guy sending a letter, just correspondence. No, this would be from the Sanhedrin. So if the Sanhedrin were specifically targeting him and trying to you know, follow uh, that path, follow uh, Paul, they could have written to the Jews in Rome and to the synagogues, and that's how it would have gotten to them. But in this case, they had not heard anything. Um, any other comments or questions about this section? All right, let's keep going then to verse 24. It says, Some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. And when, they had, uh, and when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting uh, word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke uh, through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. And you will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of the people of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, but understand uh, with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known uh, to you that this salvation God has been uh, of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. Okay, so same as we saw in Ephesus, same as we saw in most places. He spoke to the synagogue, Jews in this case only, and um, what happened? Did they believe? Some of them did, right? So it was not all in vain. It, it, it's easy to be either optimistic or pessimistic um, when you read through this. And I mean, he was driven out of Ephesus. He didn't want to go back there uh, because he would become the problem. But in every single case, he was able to establish a church. He was able to uh, get people uh, converted. In this case, same thing. There were people who believed. There were some people who were not. What does that teach us? Same today, right? Our job is to sow the seed, and um, God is the one who brings others. Okay, verse 29. When he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute amongst themselves. 
and he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. So he basically became a person who people would come to seeking wisdom, seeking to understand. Um, they had already heard about Christianity. Um, there were probably some Christians who had migrated over to Rome by this point, uh, probably not in large numbers, but he was able to uh, get this started. Now let's think about a, a little bit bigger perspective. I mean, we're in roughly 60 AD. It's actually a pretty good uh, uh, theory. This, this actually might be 61 AD by this point. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the years spoken of here. So he went to Rome, and he st effectively started uh, Christianity in Rome. Is that a big deal? Let's go back to Ephesus. Was, was Ephesus a big deal? Yeah, in the big scheme of things, right? I mean, it, it spread out a little bit, right? It, if you notice, there were churches not just in Ephesus, but remember, I forgot the name of it, but where Paul met them, just south of Ephesus, there was already another congregation, right? So it was spreading even from what he started. So it was a big deal. Rome? Rome ring a bell? <laughs> right? All roads lead to Rome. Rome is huge. So by him starting Christianity here, this is what really made Christianity, and again, this is getting into the Christianity, little c, big c, I guess you could say, however you want to say it, but this is what's getting Christianity to become the dominant religion of the world, at least in the West, right? Um, because the Romans, not right now, but eventually, they became, that became the official uh, religion then that's what allowed it to spread everywhere. Th this was an enormous deal. Um, obviously, there was a lot of uh, issues. Men get, got involved, and so it wasn't uh, the way it should be, right? It, it's not the Lord's church and the Lord's church only that spread, um, but it is what got Christianity to spread. And actually, there was, I meant to look this up. There was a book that I read, okay, many years ago now, and it was about the true church. Maybe one of y'all have seen this, and the true church through history. So a lot of uh, people say, oh, well, you know, Church of Christ, they're, they're Campbellites. Have you ever turned, heard that term? Uh, there's another guy's name, I forgot. Alexander? Or, uh, anyway, there's another guy involved too. Um, anyway, so they, they say, oh, th that's just them, right? That, that's a, just another denomination that started up around hundreds or whatever that was. Um, but this book went through and talked about all the evidence for true Christianity, the true Lord's church through time all the way to now. It was really fascinating. Um, unfortunately, the way that you can most easily identify Christianity through time is whenever you read in a history about a heresy. Because what is a heresy? It's basically teaching against the official line, right? So if you teach against the Pope when the official state religion was Catholicism, you are a heretic. So they would track things like that, um, and they had things like they found uh, uh, inscriptions like before Eric the Red even um, in the U. Well, I think it was in the U.S. It's somewhere Nova Scotia and America between there. <laughs> predating and showing how fast the church had grown, but we just don't really read about it. Why do we not read about it? Who wrote history? The victors, right? My, my, my son and I uh, disagree on this. He, he, he doesn't believe that's true. He, he, he thinks that, hey, people work it out, and, and, and he is correct in, in some circumstances. Uh, I'll give him that. But in general, when you have an entire country against you, and you're just, you know, the narrow way, it's really hard to get your message out. Okay, so this is the end of, oh, sorry, go ahead. The book Traces of the Kingdom that you read? Actually, yes, I think that is it. Yeah, okay, uh, Traces of the Kingdom. Uh, I need to look back and make sure that's exactly the one that I read, but yes, 
Um, really fascinating book. Uh, we might even have a copy here. Um, I would highly recommend it. Okay, any other comments, questions about this section? Yes. It's just history. Marty yeah. found something here, well, I don't know, some time ago about it and showed it to me that they had found a transcript of a church hundreds of years ago that come forward and showed that the church, as we know it, had been out there way before anything prior to that. They've got yes. a, a complete, about every day, every service they met, this type of thing yeah. out there. Yep. No, that's exactly right. Um, and and with that, that could be a whole semester on on it, but it's really fascinating. Yes, I can't ma'am. remember the, the guy's name, but the Nazis, you know, we, we know a lot about how they uh, persecuted and killed and genocide uh, the Jews. Mm -hmm. But they also did a lot of other groups like gypsies sure. and, and blacks and communists. And, but they also persecuted the church a lot. And uh, there's a history, and I'll try to find it, but um, where when it came out of World War II uh, and they were liberated, uh, he started he started a church. And I want to say it was in, it was close to where, like Ramstein, I think it was in Mannheim, actually. Okay. It was pretty close to Ramstein, which is a big uh, Air Force base. Right. Uh, for the, you know, ever since World War II, basically. Right, yeah. And, uh, and he was so surprised to find American soldiers who worshipped the same way that he did. The same way, and then he, he realized, wow, there was a re reformation that went on in the States completely independent yes. to the, what he called the Churches of Christ, and it was the Gemeinde Christi. Yeah. Um, and, and this is fascinating. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and so that's actually the, the name itself. I don't mean to get into this. This could be a whole other class, but... Um, but yes, the, the name itself might be different, right? Because as we found in the book of Acts, there's multiple names that we could use that we could put on the building, right? There's a church of Christ. That, that's not in Acts. Um, that's Mark, I believe it is. Um, but yeah, we could call ourselves the way. We could call ourselves Christians, you know, things like that. But yeah, find, and of course, then you get into language differences, which make it even more complicated. Okay, any more questions or comments on this section? Yes, Bob? It's kind of interesting there at the end where uh, previous to this point, Paul was used to going out and, and talking to people where here uh, he probably couldn't leave under house arrest, so he was depending yep. on other people to bring new people in to talk to. Yep. So they, uh, they had a, other people he had convinced had a great responsibility to bring in new folks. That's true. And, and think about all the people that would have had to been and how important they were in their own way, right? They're not Paul. But yet, without them, he wouldn't have been able to have been as successful. Exactly. Okay, so I mentioned that we're going to uh, come. Oh, yeah. Yes. You're persecuting me. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock, I listen to the Southern Baptist preacher. And he, this, this week, he said, we need to pray for the Lutherans. We need to pray for the Baptists. We need to pray. He didn't mention the Church of Christ, but he, every week he's damning them for baptism. Yep. Every week he deals with that and he just <laughs> persecutes the church. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of interesting because it gives me a little fuel for my fire. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so again, we, we've made it through Acts and I, I hope uh, this has been a good pace. I, I know it took six months, but forgive me, it is a rather long book. But I really like getting all the way through a book. Uh, that way you get more context and things like that. So I'll, I'll leave these open. This is open dis the discussion. Thank you. Um, what stands out for you? So Mark, I think you had something. Stone. Yeah, yeah. Barton Stone. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so what stands out for you all for Acts? Like, what do you get from this book? And it could be something all the way back from chapter one. That's fine. Yes. Yep. So that's a good point. Um, for, so Acts 2.38, uh, repent and every one of you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Um, that is, is two things. One, it's 
very specific. It helps to understand baptism itself better, but also it's the first gospel message. It's the first true teaching of the gospel after uh, Christ uh, was raised. Okay, anything else? It's the fact about it, uh, when uh, the Gentile was the first there, when uh, we saw what, I mean, Paul and Peter went down and baptized uh, the first Gentile that one day convert to the Jewish people there, it, and, and that he was a devout believer of God, that tells us, and because we hear everybody say, well, prior to that, it was everybody just by nature. Right. Everybody wasn't by nature back there. True, there wasn't a, right. a quote, church as we know it yep. on there, but people believed in God very strongly yes. before uh, we realized that. And that comes across very strong in 9 and 10, chapters 9 and 10. Yep about that and, and and I think it tells us a lot about the things that God did mm -hmm. uh, behind the scenes that, that we don't know uh, from the scriptures other than just what that one comment that I mean, one little section tells us about right. it. That, that is one of the things that I find uh, you, you see it in Acts but other places as well is there's sometimes huge time gaps in one verse right so one verse Paul might have it might cover three years or something like that. Um, but, but to your point, there's a lot that's not pointed out. There's a lot of subtle details that we're missing sometimes. Anyone else? Yes. You know, Peter saying, we must obey God rather than man. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's the, the growth of the church for me in that it started off with addition and multiplication and how it grew even in persecution. Yes. But the main thing we pray for nowadays, Lord, don't bring persecution upon us. Right. But that's when the church grew fast. So I would say that might be my answer about uh, this one. How would you summarize Acts? The gospel, I mean, that, that literally is the good news, right? So that is the, that is the, um, the telling of Christ, right? Of what he went through, of his sacrifice, who he was. Acts was the spreading, and then you get into the letters, the, the, the details, right? Sorry, did I miss something? Yes, Bob? If we only had the, the different letters, like the church, Corinth, Athens, yep. and all, it would be just kind of individual shots of their, their problems, but Acts kind of sews them all together so that it all makes sense. That's a good, good point. So Bob's saying that if you didn't have Acts, you would hear about all these places. You could find them on a map, most of them, um, but how did they get there, right? It, it wouldn't, you wouldn't have this full story. Anyone else? Yes, so the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit wasn't really um, discussed much before this, right? So Acts 2, well, Acts 2 uh, mainly, but, but even past that, we really learn a lot more about the Holy Spirit in Acts. Any other? Oh. Through his disciples. Any other comments, questions? No? Okay. Well, we are out of time. So, again, I do thank you uh, for your time and all your comments. Um, so, next Sunday night, uh, I'm not going to be uh, teaching. Uh, we're going to have uh, Revelation, um, a, another class on that. Okay. So, we're going to close out with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for everything that you've done for us today. We thank you for this time that you've given us to come and to study your word. We pray that this class has been according to your word and teach and taught truthfully. To Lord, if we have made any mistakes, help us uncover them, to understand them, and to do better. To Lord, we thank you for everything that you've given to us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.